Thank you. This is such an honor to be here. Um, there's no fireside, though, David. Where, where's the fire? I we're going to create it. Okay, we're going to create it. <laughs> um, and I'm so happy because I see Mrs. Matheson in the, in the audience as well, and it's always so happy to see Mom there. So great to see you again. And it is true, I, David and I worked together back in 2011, and we placed some uh, chief digital officers together, and I, it's been a privilege to be part of this and to see this magnificent organization grow, David. You've taken it around the globe, and, and I rely on you when we're doing chief, chief digital officer and chief data officer searches. So thank you so much for growing this. Um, and I think David also offered for me to be up here and do this today because I always ask so many questions in the audience. He said, you better get up on stage. <laughs> so here we are. And I'm delighted to have another strategic partner because if you go to our website, you will see the CDO Club is on our website. So David is there. And another strategic uh, partner that I have here is Lily Gil Valletta with me. And Lily is really a phenomenal strategic partner, and I'm going to talk more about her. But before I do that, I wanted to just bring up that I am in the executive search business, and it was really so um, warming to hear Emmy uh, from Globin speak about the importance of culture. Because when we do searches, it is all about culture and the fit of individuals going into organizations. And today, all of you out there are really very important to the culture of your organization and bringing people in and making sure that you, as he said, are intellectually curious in your companies because you're going to keep your companies alive, thriving, and more innovative. And in the search work that we're doing, I want you to know that for board positions today, what's happening is 17% of board positions um, are the people that are being placed are 50 years of age or younger. So those of you who are 50 and younger are going to have more of an opportunity to be on boards. And also 60% of new directors are women and minorities. So that's increasing for the opportunities for all of you. And 64% are actively employed. And the really good news is the new talent and new skills that boards are looking for are those who are in digital marketing, in e-commerce, and who are really involved in AI and business model transformations and new go-to-market strategies. So all of you in the audience today Boards are going to be looking for people like you. So if you're interested in going on boards, you are going to be the ones that they're going to be looking for. Now, the bad news is, though, that what's happening, according to Hunt Scanlon Media, is 50% of the S&P 500 companies are not going to be in business 10 years from now. They're going to be gone. And why is that? Because of the disruption that is, being, that is taking place. And what Emmy said, earlier in his uh, comments, it is about all of the transformations that are happening, but the disruption that is happening, the landscape of uh, that is what is happening in terms of risks, and companies that are not going to be innovative are going to go out of business. So the pressure is on for all of you to keep your companies really on the cutting edge, and for you to really manage the transformation. So what we're going to talk about today is that transformation. And what we're doing in executive search is we've partnered with, with Cultural Intel, which is using not traditional research, but AI to make sure that my clients know what's going on as far as employee sentiment is concerned. And so Lily Gil Valletta has new proprietary information and um, AI that she uses to help her clients really go into the universe and find out what are employees saying, what are customers saying, why are they doing business with one company, why are employees going to one company versus another. So she has coined and also trademarked the, um, the uh, term cultural intel and a marketing company that she also has called CN. So a little bit about Lily is, she is a former corporate exec at J&J. &J. She is an entrepreneur and tech innovator and co-founder of AI-powered Cultural Intel and cultural marketing firm CN. 
She advises Fortune 500 in startups in all, and she does this in terms of how to approach their clients as, as well as their employees. And if you Google Lily, you will find her on all the major networks. You cannot turn on Fox or CNN and not see Lily being uh, on one of those programs. She's also won many awards. 2018, the Hispanic Business Person of the Year, Top 100 Most Powerful Women of New York, and she was appointed by the mayor as member of the city's Technology Leadership Council. Recently, she received the Silicon Valley Innovation Award at Stanford University, and she has presented at the at UN, Davos, and many other organizations. I am really fortunate to have Lily and her team as partners bringing AI and big data to reimagine search at the LA Group by bringing the voice of the employees and to reimagine search for my clients. She is a great talent and she is really working with us to help my clients reinvent what they need to do in terms of bringing candidates to, to their um, organizations. With all of this, she is a wife and the mother to two boys under the age of seven. And this morning I received, well actually late last night, I received an email from her that she had 101 temperature. She may not be able to make it today. And this morning she said, I woke up feeling a little bit better. I'll be there. And here she is. So don't Lily, get too close. Don't get too close. <laughs> so Lily, will you tell us about this trademark of cultural intelligence, why it's important to the people here, why you've developed this, how you developed it, and what, what it does for clients? Yeah, so um, thank you for having me here, David and the whole team. Um, I was not going to miss this despite the fever, so I'm excited to be here. Anytime I have to talk about cultural intelligence and AI and all these um, geeky topics that for the people outside of these walls are probably like, I don't know what they're talking about in that auditorium, but it's the future and the future is now. And that is what gave birth to cultural intelligence. So when I was at Johnson & Johnson in my kind of big global marketing job, I realized that the face of America was changing very fast. In fact, what back then was like 2010 census, now it's around the corner when we see that by the year 2040, America is going to be a majority minority nation. Now, you can look at that as a diversity play, or you can look at it as a shift in commercial dynamics. And that was my big aha. I said, okay, anything that we're doing, any piece of data, any insight, any go-to-market plan has to be inclusive of the new face of the market. We need to have, and that was the light bulb moment, cultural intelligence to understand in numbers what this opportunity means and what do I need to do differently in this path to transformation. So that is the birth. So I always give credit to my friends at j and It was like, that was the muse, that was the moment. And the definition of it, as we describe it, is, is the ability to be aware of, understand, and apply cultural competence into everyday business decisions. Um, and that is the key, apply that competence into everyday business decisions. So I was excited to talk about that here because we are in the business of better, faster, more accurate business decision making powered by data, powered by the digital transformation we're talking about. And I guess my premise is, if it's not culturally intelligent, we may be missing part of the story. So that's why we do what we do, and now we've tech enabled how to do that. So tell us how you do this. You scrape the universe. This is your product. You've developed it. We've called on clients together. We've sat with them. We've shown them what the, the sentiment is of the employees. But where do you go? Is it the blogs? Is it social media? How do yeah, you, how do, you so, do it? Yeah. Um, it, this is, let me just kind of distill it in, in simple terms, and this room understands it in a blink. Uh, uh, what we have been able to do is develop a, an algorithm that is able to go out and take every open source digital discussion that is available everywhere. So not just social media, but review comments on Amazon.com or comments that are in the Wall Street Journal, everywhere there is a contextual discussion happening about the matter that we want to understand. We take that and the way we've been training our AI 
you know, text analytics, natural language processing, the different tools put to work together, is able to pick up patterns in the voice of the people. Because the wisdom of the crowds gives us really the whispers into what matters or not and what's motivating decision making. So applied to many different topics and areas, we're able to kind of proactively keep a pulse into how people truly feel about a company, a product, even a politician when we're not asking. And that is basically what we've been able to do. And we call it culture intel because we're always looking at the layers of not just people as people and one big chunk of you know data sets and unstructured comments, but people self-identify when they talk so we can see what that sounds like for women or for men or for Hispanic, black, Asian, LGBTQ. So all of a sudden we add a layer of culture mm -hmm. and geography to any piece of insight, making it very actionable. So that's uh, in a nutshell, I guess, what we do. And you also do this for uh, with customers and you've been able to tell like why uh, with one company, maybe uh, more Caucasian women are buying the products than African-American women. Correct. And how to change that, right? Yeah. So I think, um, and I think we have probably some sample data up here. I'll click through it as, as we chat. But um, what's interesting about this, and, and I love, I forgot whose presentation it was. I think it was our friends from Globant um, that were saying that, you have the data, but you're not applying it for business. <laughs> um, and our obsession is how do we take this wisdom of the crowds and apply it for business? Mm -hmm. So marketers spend all this money doing good old focus groups. We even as a country spend all this money doing polls to try to figure out who's going to win an election. And here's people telling, telling us every internet minute how they truly feel. So that's really where the magic happens when you can look at it across different um, groups. So. That particular consumer example that you're talking about, Janice, I'm going to go totally like off script. I think this is towards the end. Do, 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 don't look. Don't look. We'll get there. Like, what are all those charts? I think it's at the end. Here it is. So you all probably remember when Nike um, put out the Colin Kaepernick ad. So people very quickly reacted. Even the markets reacted very quickly. If you saw and if you recall, it dropped, I think, 3% the Nike stock value almost instantly. Now, when you look at what happened to brand Nike when this went out, and if you just looked at overall sentiment, so actually this is labeled a little bit weird, the left is what was the overall perception of that before the ad for brand Nike, and what was it after? So you could say, oh, see, the stock value drop, and that was right because it went up in negative. That's true, and we saw it financially. However, because we do cultural intelligence, breaking it by gender, by ethnicity, et cetera, brand Nike overall went down. However, when you look at brand Nike by segment, by consumer segment, it actually went up amongst Hispanic, African-American, women, and millennials. And we saw this in a matter of days from that Nike ad actually hitting the market, but the actual market itself and the sales reports didn't see that until four months later in December. So there are ways for us to pick this up proactively, and that's an example where if I just see a data point for one value representing the whole, but don't dig deeper, you miss the cultural intelligence underneath that really points to the fact that this was very effective with the markets that they probably wanted to hit. But if I just stop at the first number, I make the wrong assumption. So that's why this matters for us that our crunching data numbers and mining insights for better decisions. And then going back to Emmy's uh, presentation earlier, if your culture isn't working, then you're not going to have a productive organization. Go back to employee sentiment. You have another slide there. When yeah. <laughs> for different groups, <clears throat> uh, back for, yeah. This no, one? No, the other one. We, do, do, do. So We're employee going sentiment off. Uh, in terms of uh, empowerment and compensation. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so, um, sorry, we we're kind of, we said, let's just have slides in case we need to put something up. Okay, so what we're looking at here, I love this. This is another point yeah. that validates that unless we add a layer of cultural intelligence to our insights, you may not see the full story. So this is particularly as it relates to what are drivers and barriers 
that people express about working, this is a particular banking institution, by the way. So if I just develop an entire intervention for attracting and retaining people based on my overall ranking of drivers and barriers, in this case, these are the things that they qualified as barriers, I may miss the full picture because that top barrier for engagement, in this case, of these employees at this company is completely different by segment. For women, Hispanic, African Americans, and millennials, barrier number one is unique. So here's my challenge to the room. We live in an era where we're obsessed with user design, you know, user personalization, and content is king, and you wanna make people feel like, you know, the experience they have digitally is made for them. However, when we're developing and go to market strategies or talent strategies, we're still doing one size fits all. So it's a little bit contradicting when to the outside world of our strategies, we're being so obsessed with user centric everything, but internally in this case for our own people, many cases is still one size fits all. So this is the power again of using cultural intelligence into the insights that we develop and in this case, without depending on a survey or a focus group, being able to pick up the authentic, unsolicited, and unbiased voice of employees, in this case, about this particular banking institution. So that proves the point, once again, that one size doesn't fit all. Yeah, so we're using Lily's cultural intel to work with our clients to show them culturally where they may be off, internally with what their employees are saying, and then if they're trying to attract employees at all levels, what they need to do, maybe policy-wise and practice-wise, to really be the best employer of choice and attract it in their competitive frame at that talent. Because, as I said earlier, in 10 years, according to Hunt Scanlon Media, 50% of the, uh, the S&P 500 will not be in business. And that's a very scary thought, you know. So the war for talent is on every single day. And all of you need to be really concerned and involved. And as an investor, we're all really concerned uh, with that as well. So let's open it for questions and yeah. see if there are any um, questions. Or did you want to add something? I just want to close with something as I'm making you all flip around these slides. I love this slide. So we are probably enabling our organizations to achieve ultimate you know, business performance. That's what it's all about. So that is measured by the folks in Wall Street with the stock value, which is the product of many different factors. However, we know that we live in an era that is putting a ton of demand on leaders like you. Why? Because we not only have to react very quickly to things that may impact um, your brand equity, so this is the stuff that marketers lose sleep over, right? But at the same time, there is this big pressure point of inclusion that keeps coming up. Um, that, that women, you know, pay gap and representation and all kinds of other things that are important to you, the boards of your companies. But then there's also add to that the need to be sustainable and impact driven and a good corporate citizen. So I guess I want you all to realize that while we wait for the perfect metric to be developed, um, there are signals today that when we apply the technologies that many of us already have today, but through this lens of a 360 view of the company, could help you with a new proxy of information for brand equity, corporate social responsibility, and inclusion that can be produced to proactively give your decision makers a view of the barriers and drivers that people manifest organically every single internet minute. So this is almost like my call to action um, and, and there is a way to do it. You know, we figure out a way to do this with many big companies, but I bet you have sources and ways to also do it for your own. Um, so you add cultural intelligence into everything you do for a 360 view at performance. So now we have one minute. <laughs> Two. Two. Is there, are there any questions? No questions? We have to give them six, 16 or 17 seconds, I heard. Right. <laughs> yep. 
Mm -hmm. So we actually, when we do Wait, the, the yeah, so David is asking about Glassdoor and all these places. So Glassdoor, LinkedIn, Dice, et cetera, are one, two, or three of the thousands of data points that we pick up from when we're doing cultural metrics for companies. Uh, because we don't point our algorithm to just go to a certain set of destinations. It actually works kind of like the Google crawlers work that it gets deployed to grab anywhere there is a contextual conversation happening about, you know, X company as a place to work. So they are in the data set, but they're not the only places where we go. There is a question back there. That what conversation is true or not? So hard to hear. Yeah, I can hear. Can somebody repeat it for me? There's, there's a mic. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm probably going to paraphrase and assume what the question is because I get almost so, the same questions every time. There you go. Caesar got a mic. Sorry, we're going to make you repeat it. My question is, wow, <laughs> how do you, how are you able to rank all those, I mean, you have a lot of sorts of information, right? How you're able to rank which ones are relevant or actual true versus the other ones that are just conversations that not necessarily mean anything to a company, for example. So that is where the way we've been trading the, um, there's the combination of text analytics and natural language processing that goes into grabbing the full context of a conversation. So when I'm mining a company as a place to work, we will only pick up the discussions that truly live inside that parameter of as a place to work. That is where, you know, for those of you technologists in the room, you can probably figure out what I'm, where I'm going. It's not keyword based, so we start with that. It's the way like a Boolean search works where there is all these adjacencies to a topic that sounds like a discussion about a place to work that are the ones that are picked up. Now, are there trolls? Are there sour grapes that hated their employer and they just talk bad about them every day? Sure, but our M values are so big that that normalizes almost the same way that statisticians have plus five or minus 10% or 10%, you know, error rate. Um, but it's big enough, the end values are so big that it will normalize if there is one person out of seven million data points that is the one sour employee. So there are ways for us to kind of proactively prevent that. Um, you know, bots can be picked out too if there's somebody just posting, posting, posting. But for places, companies as a place to work, it is rare that somebody will be deliberately talking bad about Google as a place to work. And if it's one person, it will be one out of seven, 10 million that is gonna get normalized when we look at the product of the whole. We can talk more about it if you want though. My question is for uh, Janice. Um, you, where you, is the question? Over here. Oh, it's like, where is you, it? You spoke to the importance of culture. Um, how are you seeing though uh, the skills that are required to land these roles, how are those changing uh, in a world where, for example, when the CDO club started, it was all chief digital officers. Now it's probably 50-50 chief data, chief digital. How are you seeing the skills evolving to meet the new needs of the organizations you're hiring for? Mm. Yeah, so, you know, I think that the um, skills will continue to evolve, but the culture is going to be slow to evolve. <laughs> Um, and I think that uh, Annie brought up some great points, and that is that, you know, there's the, the, the culture is still sleepy, and I think the, the more you bring in chief digital and data transformational officers that'll push the culture a little bit, we'll, we'll move it along. I think intellectual curiosity, I think great character, great courage, uh, I, I have 10 C's that I have on my website. 
um, and I described them in some detail about what that means. I think people need to come into organizations and push the culture, but it can't be just one voice. It has to be multiple voices. So you can't be the lone soldier, and you have to have champions in the organization that bring you in and want you to move that along. So I think the skills, um, are, are, if you have them, it's, it's more than skills, it's attributes. It, it's, it's what I'm talking about in terms of that courage and that character to uh, come in and, and make change. And I think there are organizations that have to change, because like I said, if you don't innovate, you're gonna become a dinosaur and go out of business. So for those of you in the room that are brave, a brave heart and can come in and move the culture along with great leaders, and you have to look at the leader in the company. Will he or she move that company along with you? Am I answering your question? I hope so. Janice, there was a meeting you and I were at together not yeah. too long ago with the top five banking institution. You can probably guess. Um, but there was something that stayed in my mind and kind of goes with this question. They're big challengers out there stealing their super rock star talent are not the other big banking institutions. But the fact that these brilliant minds that want to innovate and create new things are hesitant to join big organizations because they may not be able to bring to life the full power of that innovation. So I think that's very interesting because you are all leaders with the CDO or CIO title. Imagine what that leaky pipe could be of people that rather go to the startup with two people paying them 50 grand you know, a year, even though they could be 300K somewhere else, but that's a place that allows me to play with innovation versus this big corporation that moves so slow, therefore I don't wanna go there. So that really stayed with yeah. me when they said that. But do you know there's a book out actually, and I'm forgetting the name of it, talking about the large corporations actually have the wherewithal to have all these incubators within them. So they're actually now trying to bring up more, bring in more talent to generate more of these better ideas. So it's a, a yin yang here. I, th I think uh, the large corporations are not going to let themselves lose. So uh, I think. If you have the skills, go in there and be brave and bring others along with you. And I think there are some great leaders out there that want to hire that, those great skills. And we're working with some of these large corporations. I got to tell you, they are desperate to bring in great skills and like people like you, the very large corporations. Yeah. yeah. So, David, thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. Thank you, thank you so you, much. Lily.